Right, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Duncan Calloway from the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And Duncan, you have the 30 minutes. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, thanks to everybody for organizing this. Brian contacted, Brandon Tyraj contacted me maybe even almost a year ago, it feels like, about this conference, and it's fine. It's really fun to finally see it happening. Um, so, oh no, I've lost the connection. Um, okay, so well, the title that I have uh, listed is Understanding Stability in Low Inertia Power Systems, but um, so I'm very new to this area. It's maybe been a year and a half that I've really kind of been trying to go deep into it. And so I'm going to try to exercise a lot of humility in this talk. And my first act of humility is maybe a, a modification of the title, which is Exploring Stability, because I, I think that we're only starting to scratch the surface on some of this stuff. So I, I hope that this will be uh some fodder for conversation um rather than me kind of telling you what the end of the story is so i i read the scoping document i really enjoyed the perspective in the scoping document and i thought i'll spare you the the time of a top 10 list although i did create like a sort of letterman style top 10 list of great <laughs> quotes but i'll at least do three um so there was one quote um can heterogeneous systems containing Grid following, grid forming, inverters, and synchronous machines operate together to guarantee frequency and regulation stability. And this quote, I think, um, and all of the sort of preamble that led up to that quote in the scoping document that does a really good job of summarizing one of the questions that we were sorting out and, and searching to answer in this um, talk that I'm going to give you here. Another really important one, what are the interactions between machine excitation systems and inverters with either grid forming um, or grid following control. So this is another thing that uh, going into this work, we were really committed to understand is um, if, if and when instabilities arise in low inertia systems, um, what's driving it? What are the kind of root mechanisms that are causing these instabilities? And then finally, this is like the great sort of overarching thing that I think kind of summarizes everything we're trying to do here is assumptions that underlie current generation design and control approaches must be re-examined, modified, or even redefined. And this is really why I've tried to start getting into this area, because I think we're at an incredible point in time. So much happening, so much potential to kind of change the course for the way things go, but it's clear that there are a lot of challenges that need to be solved. Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to do in this talk, is at least to start talking about what some of the challenges are. Um, so just a little bit more setting, of course, um, I, you know, when I look at how I've seen this area evolve over the last perhaps decade or so, the initial focus was on low inertia and thinking about the kind of Newtonian mechanics and swing dynamics issues. Uh, like the last talk, thinking about things like rate of change of frequency, nadir and steady state. And, and from my perspective, one of the earliest um, efforts to understand this, uh, these issues in a way that I think has led to the kind of study that we're doing that I'm gonna talk about today was Joe Edo and John Undrill's work um, back in 2010, where they were looking at the Western interconnection, trying to understand what frequency dynamics might look like with varying levels of wind penetration on the interconnection. So they go one gigawatt, four gigawatts, nine gigawatts. It sounds small today, of course, but back then it was important to be looking at those levels. Um, and they found, you know, they, they focused on frequency dynamics, um, I think understandably, because the sort of intuitively we think about inertia and those Newtonian mechanics as being the things we need to focus on. Um, but the style of the, of the work was to say, let's just explore and understand what happens when we get higher and higher penetrations of these low inertia systems. Um, but I, I think this has been an, an issue today, uh, yesterday, um, uh, and, and I think people are appreciating this more and more. It's more than just those Newtonian dynamics. We need to start thinking about higher order system dynamics originating from control loops on the machines, from the flux dynamics on the machines, but also on the converters, um, their own control as well. And so this kind of signals then the need to be thinking about things in terms of both small signal stability and transient stability. Uh, this is a figure from a paper I'll talk a little bit more about in a second that Yasha and Lin and others have um, written um, back in 2017, uh, published in, at NAPS. Um, but so today, what I'll be focusing on mostly is a small signal stability perspective. So the structure then of how I'll do the talk is first um, exploring stability in low, but not necessarily zero inertia power systems. Um, and as I said, exploring factors that drive small signal instability when we have high penetrations of voltage source converters. 
uh, just kind of a quick cut to the chase key findings. Um, one of the things that we find seems to be a generic result is that it's early instabilities when they arise, depending on the scenarios we look at, they, they, we find basically at all sort of pen, all kinds of scenarios at some penetration level of small instability, the small signal instability arises and it seems to always begin with interactions between the machine's power system stabilizer and the voltage source converter um, inner control loops. Um, uh, another issue, uh, network structure and voltage source converter type, whether it's grid following or grid forming, uh, seems to have a pretty significant impact on stability. And it's this hybrid or heterogeneous system where we have grid forming, grid following, and synchronous machines in the simulation work that we're doing that seem to have the worst stability margins with respect to how much we can back off the synchronous machines and maintain a small signal sta stable system. So this is actually work that started with Uros Markovich um, when I was doing sabbatical at ETH Zurich last spring. Uh, and there are a number of different people that have contributed, um, but mostly out of Gabriela Hoog's group there, um, as well as uh, Miguel Esfretos of Andrew Esfretos at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, I'll, I'll give you, sort of time permitting, a couple of vignettes on some other work that we're doing at Berkeley to try to get uh, our foot in the door in this area. So um, a, a quick, Couple of slides on storage sizing for inertia provision and also model order reduction. And I'll talk about my pet project for curriculum development, which I was just talking with Brian and Daniel about. Okay, so thinking about this small signal stability stuff, it, um, on prior research, although I feel like the, you know, for me at least, my own attention span in this area, going back 10 years to that work that Joe and John did on the on the low inertia side, I think was really important. But in terms of thinking about stability, small signal analysis, um, one of the papers that we feel like really kind of captured at least the spirit of the style of modeling that we're doing here was out of Toronto with Reza Aravani and Lane about 12 years ago now, where they were looking at um, microgrid models with synchronous machines and voltage source converters with a focus on model validation, but looking at linearizations and small signal stability. Um, as well as line dynamics. So this is a very important um, aspect that was mentioned yesterday as well. Um, and it was, it's an important part of the analysis that I'll be talking about here. Um, Bob Lassiter's group with um, the, the paper that seems, or the actually PhD dissertation that I think um, has been a nice building point or a nice touchstone for some of the work that we've done um, was Micah Erickson's PhD where he built a, a model of the CERTS microgrid um, and among other things, went through a small signal stability analysis using a participation factor style approach, which is something that we'll be doing here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but then um, Wei, Du, and, and Bob, uh, and their co-author, Kalsa, um, took that model and did a little bit more work to try to understand. Now, let's do a parameter sweep. Let's try to understand as we start to change some of these parameters um, on the converter, at least, uh, when does the system begin to destabilize? And so this figure is from their paper from last year in Transactions on Smart Grid, where perhaps not too surprisingly, as you reduce the filter inductance or increase the gain on the droop, you tend to destabilize these systems. Um, and, and we'll do, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of similar sweeps in this work. Um, something important I think that we're trying to build on here relative to that work is that they didn't look at different kind of network design issues. Um, or different levels of voltage source converter composition. Now, the next, I think, important paper, and this was really the one that, that kind of got me started thinking really hard about these issues, was um, something that, as I said before, Yashen um, and Brian Johnson and Syraj and a few others published um, in NAPS a couple of years ago, where they went through a small signal stability analysis exercise using a, um, I think Brian mentioned it yesterday, an aggregated model uh, for voltage source converters. Um, basically a sort of fancy way of doing per unit work. Um, and, and then ask the same kind of question that, that Undril and, and Edo and others had asked with the inertia side of things, but instead now thinking about small signal stability with voltage source converters, as we increase the penetration of those machines into um, uh, something that's at least attempting to model a large scale transmission scale system, what drives small, what, at least when do small signal stabilities arise? And this was really surprising to me to see, you know, in their simulations, this is an example of a parameter sweep they did where they're, this is on the x-axis is the fraction of generation coming from the voltage source converters. Important to note grid following converters in this paper. I know that they've done some other follow-on work since then. 
with other kinds of converters. Um, but in this case, at around 50% penetration, that is when you back off the synchronous machines to only produce 50% of supply, um, then, then the eigenvalues, one of those eigenvalues crosses into the left half plane and you destabilize the system. Um, and so the, I, I was really surprised by this. I thought we said really, if we sort of take this from a different approach, would we get a similar result? So a couple of things that we thought were worth at least trying to build on in that work was um, uh, the network model, there was in, in this at least early work, um, they hadn't put a network dynamics in um, and just looked at grid following converters. And so we thought, well, maybe we could start looking at grid forming converters um, and, and, and a network model and, and see if these results are robust. Um, so, uh, so then what we saw then is, a, is an opening or something to look at a little bit more specifically, like I was saying before, heterogeneous systems with different kinds of converters and synchronous machines at different buses. Looking at the importance of network dynamics, um, including, you know, not uh, at least sort of standard, but still high order models of synchronous machines, including the AVR and the power system stabilizer, which was something that we hadn't seen in earlier work. And also trying to focus on understanding what are the what are the factors, this participation factor style analysis, what physics or control loops are implicated in the initial destabilization. Um, so the approach is one of just constructing a bunch of differential algebraic equations um, and going through the pain of trying to get all of those to talk to each other of the different converters um, on a network model. Um, and then to sweep through a few different parameters. We, we looked at, in particular, penetration of the different converters, as well as um, the importance of network dynamics and topology. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of results on that. This is a picture of the South Australian network that I won't show you results for that yet, unfortunately. But the idea, kind of the spirit in all of this, was to build up a DAE modeling framework where we could actually go as far as looking at larger scale uh, systems. But I'll just show you some two bus and nine bus results. But ultimately, stay tuned. I think we'll be able to look at larger systems. So the VSC model, um, we look, as I said before, both grid following and grid forming converter models. So I'm not going to dwell too much time on the block diagram here. But suffice it to say, it's sort of a standard um, model with a reactive power controller, active power current, ultimately current source model. We, it's average, so we get rid of the PWM dynamics. Um, uh, following, I think, Brian's uh, definition, you know, if there's a PLL in the grid following, without the grid following or, or a PLL, then we're grid forming and running a standard sort of droop control. Um, and, and so I'll show you results with both of those kinds of converters. Synchronous generator model, again, it's a pretty standard, you know, kind of taken out of the Kundor textbook. We've got fast six order machine dynamics, so down to subtransient voltage dynamics in the machine. Um, plus eight additional states, so mostly those are control states. Um, and it's this the kind of standard stuff, so I think that there's going to be a lot more exploring to do in the future, but so it's just the simple round rotor model. Um, we take kind of off-the-shelf governor, power system stabilizer, and exciter models. So, so I think all of the results that we have have to be taken with a grain of salt because we have to sort of pin down, you know, what we think are standard assumptions on the models, but still, you know, they're, they're a very specific case. And with the network modeling, I'll show you initial results with just a two bus model. And actually the earliest results that I'll show you are without network dynamics. So we have a network, but just with a standard power flow equation solving interaction between the two of them. But then I'll show you some later on some results where we include that. Um, so I'll also show you a couple of results in a, a later on where we look at a nine bus system that enables us to look at the heterogeneous. So in the first case with just the two bus, Imagine the idea is we, we begin with synchronous machine providing all the, serving all the load, and then we add in either grid forming or grid following at the other node. One really important thing I should say is that we've just got passive, you know, uh, RL um, loads, and I think that that's something to look at for the future, but just to kind of limit the scope, that's where we started with on the, on the load side. Uh, but then with the nine bus, what we'll be able to do is look at heterogeneous systems with grid forming, grid following, and synchronous machines. And I'll show you. Okay, so here's the first little bit of results where the way to read this figure is um, on the x-axis, we're looking at the percent penetration of the voltage source converter. So we begin when it's a low number, 50% would mean it's 50% voltage source converter, 50% synchronous machine. 55% would mean 55% voltage source converter. 
And so in this case, we're looking at a grid following. So we've got the phase lock loop. And you can see that it, it's a little bit hard to see here, but at a, uh, because the eigenvalues are still pretty slow, but they're still small, but they're still positive. At around 60% penetration with this model, we see that that first eigenvalue crosses over into the left half plane. Um, sorry, right half plane. And um, when we use this participation factor style analysis, so the way to think about this is when you do an eigenvalue analysis, you've got associated eigenvectors, and there's particular states that matter the most in constructing the most important eigenvalue that's crossing over into the unstable region. And so what the participation factor style analysis allows you to do is say, okay, what, what states are driving it? Which are the ones that are the most important in, make, in destabilizing the system? And it's an interaction between the synchronous generators, power system stabilizer, i.e. ultimately voltage excitation, uh, and the inner control loop, so the current and voltage control loops on the voltage source converter. Um, so it's that interaction there. So if you think about time scale of response, so the, the current source converter is about, you know, we're talking about like 10 uh, milliseconds uh, and under maybe for the time scale there, whereas a power system stabilizer is up in the hundreds of milliseconds range. So it's, one could argue that at least in part, it's the, it's the fast actuation of the grid form following converter in this case that's driving those instabilities. This is consistent, I think, with what um, Yash and Lin and his co-authors saw in this earlier paper that I was mentioning, in that they found that when they remove the AVR, that is, they just assume the AVR perfectly tracks whatever the voltage regulation signal needs to be, that that's the only case that they found that fully stabilized their system across all penetration levels. Um, so something similar here, the PSS via the AVR is destabilizing the system, but it's in interaction with the inner control loops and the converter. Um, so uh, let's see, moving on then to thinking about what happens if we do a grid forming sort of penetration. Uh, so here now we're, we've removed the PLL and we're putting droop on both voltage and um, frequency into the control um, of the device. Uh, something that I should have mentioned both on the last result and this one, there's no network dynamics yet. So we're just using algebraic constraints on the power flow. Um, so when we look then with grid forming, what are the kind of key things that change? So first of all, the stability margins are better. That is, we can get higher penetrations. It's more like 78% penetration uh, before the system begins to destabilize. Um, but the origin of the instability is the same. This is the power system stabilizer interacting with the inner control loops. Um, so, uh, you know, generically, I think we see the same style of instability, but at least the grid forming converter is managing to allow slightly higher penetrations. Another, I think, big difference to see versus the grid following, something I didn't mention before, at the higher penetration levels, the swing dynamics really start to matter in terms of dictating what's driving the instabilities. Um, when we look at, as well as I should say, um, the PLL at sort of intermediate penetration levels. So you, as you would expect, when we go to grid forming, we remove the PLL, so that's not implicated anymore, but the swing dynamics are gone as well as being a driver. Which you would expect to see because Um, okay, so now I want to talk about two things on this slide. The first is what happens when we start adding network dynamics. And the second is what happens when we've got 100% converter-based generation, but a mix of uh, grid forming and grid following. So I didn't show you these eigenvalues in this way before, but um, the, the sort of grayed out lines are showing in the yellow and blue case, it's the eigenvalues um, for the synchronous machine plus a voltage source converter. Either capital F means grid forming, little f means grid following. And so you can see that this is the cases that we were just looking at where these lines sort of lift off into the positive range for the real part of the eigenvalue. So when we add, that's without network dynamics. When we add network dynamics, that is we allow, there's like an I dot term in the, in the uh, ODEs describing the network then we still have an instability arise. In fact, for the, oh, I should have said actually, it's the blue and the gold here, these two. This is grid following, this is grid forming. So the grid forming results are almost identical. That is when we add the network dynamics, it doesn't really seem to change anything. With the grid following, 
uh, here's the dark blue, that's the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue for the grid following case with network dynamics. And you can see it, it crossed before at a lower percentage, but it's still crossing at a relatively low percentage. Um, and it's still crossing. Whereas the important thing that I want to talk about now is when we do voltage source converters, grid forming, and then begin to add grid following slowly. So now instead of having a synchronous machine to start, we say 100% grid forming. And then we start to add grid following. Now that percentage here means how much grid following are we adding to the grid formed system. And there we see that the network dynamics fully stabilize the system. So adding in the network dynamics really matter here, and we never get to a point where the eigenvalue becomes, where any of the eigenvalues become positive. So I wanna kind of contrast this to Marcelo uh, Colombino's results yesterday, where he was talking about network dynamics destabilizing the system with grid forming converters. And it's an app, it's, it's, I, I think that it's an apples to apples compare, or apples to oranges comparison to make with these two studies. And I think the most important thing to think about is that in our case, we've got all of the grid forming converters just at one bus, right? So there's no network dynamics between the grid forming converters. And I think that that's something to look at more going forward. So the, the network dynamics are really just between the grid forming and the grid following. Um, so it's sort of the same story though in the end, I think to what Marcelo was saying yesterday, which is that the, uh, clearly the network dynamics really matter in identifying whether or not there's gonna be any instability in this kind of a system. Um, Okay, so let's see. Now, okay, so now with the nine bus model, um, here, we, the way that we set it up is we said, okay, at this bus, we're gonna put just grid forming converters. At this bus, bus two, we're gonna put just grid following converters. And then down at bus one, we'll have synchronous machines. And no, as I said before, between the grid formers, there's no network. It's just between the different heterogeneous kinds of devices. And then with this model, it's a transmission scale model. And we started with an, an initial, the black lines are sort of what you can download from the various websites. And we say in that case, basically 40% of all network connections are made, all possible network connections between buses. And so we call this a 40% case. And then we want to say, well, what happens is we increase the connectivity of the network. So another case that I'm gonna show you results for is with 60%, which is the red lines here. It's a little bit to see that color, but it's basically creating connections between all of the generator buses. And then a third case, we keep those connections and then we also add connections between the load buses. And we want to understand, well, how much does adding, now with network dynamics, it's not just the algebraic constraints, it's the um, ODEs on network dynamics. When we add that network and strengthen it, how does that change the stability results? The other thing that I'm about to show you in, the, in this little picture, because it's gonna be a lot of results at the same time, is, uh, the difference between heterogeneous and uh, just two, like a synchronous machine and a grid following or synchronous machine and a grid. So maybe I'll point that out first. So P0 in this case is a case where we look at grid, follow, grid forming, grid following, and synchronous machines. And then P1 is a case where we only look at uh, synchronous machines and grid following. That is, we don't put any generation at this green. And, and P, uh, sorry, P big F is where we include the grid forming converter at this green bus three, but there's no grid following. So we want to try to get at one of these questions that was in the scoping document, which is like heterogeneous systems as we add them, what happens? So what's on the Y axis then is the percent, um, the maximum stable percentage of voltage source converters. So in sum, so if it's 53%, that means that in total, both grid forming and grid following, that's the maximum percentage that the system will tolerate for this particular set of parameters um, and remain stable. So a couple of takeaways then. First, the hybrid system has a much lower stability margin, right? So when we have, as it's modeled here, when we have both grid forming and grid following converters interacting with the synchronous machine, we have to maintain more synchronous machine penetration on the grid to maintain stability. So what does that signal? I think it just means that like, as we increase the complexity of all of these different control loops, we just have more opportunities for instabilities to arise. Um, we have higher penetration, maximum penetration levels when it's just one type of converter. The other thing to see is that as we increase the strength of the network, then the stability margins get better. Um, which is perhaps not, not too surprising. Um, 
Okay, so some, some takeaways on this part then, some kind of closing thoughts here. So one possible conclusion, although I think there's a lot more simulations to do, but there are cases where you can see, uh, although Marcellus is a counterexample, you're, there are cases where you can see 100% penetration of converters being um, uh, something that's small signal stable, but perhaps getting to that point, going through the transition is hard. These sort of intermediate levels being small signal unstable. Line dynamics are critical. This is a theme that is not too surprising and folks have been talking about already. It seems that heterogeneous systems are more challenging. That is the stability margins are, are, are smaller there. So I think a question here is, well, exactly what's driving it? Is it just because of the way that we put these machines on the system or does it have something to do actually with the dynamics within the converters themselves? Um, and we didn't look specifically at the uh, participation factors in that case. Um, so I think an important takeaway is that it's, uh, we see the, the initial onset of instability happening due to an interaction between the synchronous machine and the inner voltage and current control loops on the converter. And so I think that if you wanna do stability assessments, what this signals is that if you're gonna do any model order reduction, you better keep those inner voltage and current control loops um, represented in your model. Um, so then for me, the only kind of generic result across many recent papers and, and the work that we're talking about here is that I think that these small signal instabilities are realistically possible. I think we need to be thinking pretty carefully about how we're uh, putting constraints on the way that voltage source converter control loops um, get implemented at higher penetrations. How we're gonna do that, I have no idea. I mean, I have a couple of thoughts here. What are the solutions? This is one thing that Ben was talking about yesterday, maybe, and it was actually mentioned with the Migrate project as well this morning, maybe we need to just slow down those inner control loops. It's a matter of time scales, and if we try to get them to respond less quickly, then we'll get a response that is stable. Um, I do think, though, that we need to understand if other kinds of grid-forming converters would have the same sorts of problems, whether it's a virtual synchronous machine or matching control of virtual oscillator control. I think that that's worth exploring further. Um, but then there's, I think, also this points three and four in terms of the solutions. It's like classical control design stuff. Maybe we need to adjust the gains. Maybe we need something that's like a power system stabilizer sitting on a voltage source converter to damp out oscillations. Um, uh, I, I sort of, I, I, I recoil at the idea of increasing the complexity even further of all of the control loops on these machines, but um, it's possible that that's one of the only easy paths that we'll have to, um, an industry acceptable paths that we'll have to so I think um, in the interest of time, it looks like I'm running over just a little bit. I'm just going to put up a, a couple of quick slides just to let you know about some of the things we're doing. Other work we're doing at Berkeley. One relates to model order reduction to try to take high order converter models and get them to simulate faster with, um, with good, uh, still acceptable dynamic responses. And we're getting some encouraging, but still lots of work to be resolved there. We're also thinking about sort of issues that others are as well, storage sizing and placement particular optimizing how much storage you have on the PC side to provide inertia um, and increase the gear as much as possible. And then this is actually, this is a GitHub page that we have from this course that I'm teaching this semester where I've kind of fed my uh, graduate students to the wolves and I've got groups of four graduate students, power electronics and power systems people all together. I've got four groups. I've got like 16 students in the class. Really exciting. And I'm telling all of them just go build a DAE model um, I'm doing some lecture and helping them on it as well, but just try to explore some of these issues on your own. And so my hope is that, you know, in a couple of years when we start graduating these students, we'll have um, some people that are ready to tackle even more of these problems. Um, but if you're interested, once the semester's over, there's gonna be hopefully lots of stuff on this GitHub that you can pull down uh, to play with their simulation models. Um, okay, so I, there are lots of people to acknowledge here. This is mostly work that comes out of collaboration with um, people at ETH Zurich resulting from Radical there. Um, I, I want to also call out um, Vigel Espretos, who's my colleague at the International Lab, who's also been very good at driving the efforts here. So um, thanks for your time, and maybe there's a little bit of time for questions, depending how much Daniel wants to run over. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in small signal stability, 
maybe I'm a little confused. Is this just the, the one eigenvalue that we could do? And I'm wondering if you're, you're, you're confusing frequency, primary frequency control versus small signal stability versus the, uh, maybe the dynamics of the of voltage gradient, uh, control system and the signals you want and, and whatnot. And, and that seems to be somewhat of a theme in this group in confusing frequency rate, primary frequency control has an eigenvalue. And electromechanical dynamics have different eigenvalues. So I'm wondering when you show your thoughts about instability, are you truly focusing on the electromechanical modes versus maybe a control mode versus the common, what we often call common mode of the entire um, so we're kind of agnostic to it in the sense that we're building the full model. I mean, we're modeling as well as we can. So we include all of these things, the flux dynamics in the machine, the, um, all the filter dynamics, as well as all of the control dynamics on the various kinds of machines. And we just find an operating point, linearize around that operating point and say, do we have all the eigenvalues in the left half plane or not? If one is positive, then we go and say, okay, what's, what, it, what are the participation factors associated with that eigenvalue? And then we just look to see, okay, what results? So this is an example then where we're seeing that in this case, that first eigenvalue that becomes positive um, is, has an eigenvector that you can associate with the power system stabilizer and the inner control loops on the voltage source converter. So it's, um, I don't think we're confusing the issues. I think that what we're really trying to do is to, is to put together a modeling framework that allows us to let all of the issues percolate as they need to. But I think it's, what is important to say is that it's for a very you know, specific, probably idiosyncratic modeling framework. And I think that we're trying to capture all of the right details. That is, we're trying to capture the frequency dynamics and the um, the control loop dynamics and the electromagnetic dynamics in machines, um, uh, but it's just one model. And I think we need to sort of think about how do we expand this out into other kinds of network models and kinds of machines. Okay, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, what we have looked at is, as, as you say, um, what you call the grid uh, following convert with PLL, but mm. The outer control loop that does the ESS actually in a way. Mm, of mm. course, that requires that the inner control loop, current control loop, is yeah. sort of faster than the outer yeah. control loop. Right. So, what, what frequency is your unstable mode at typically? Ah, that's a good question. I can't, I can't pull out that because answer. That's what I said, but yeah. Uh, you mean ah? So I I would um, I'm almost certain that it's a it's a uh, lower frequency than the inner control loops themselves. So I think we could do what you're talking about in your models, which is on the outer loops, we stick in a sort of damping uh, mode, like a power system stabilizer. I think, and um, it's it's encouraging to know that that at least. In, in, in your case that's happening and perhaps it's my you know being new to the area I don't know how often that sort of a loop is embedded I would say certainly for like utility scale solar applications I'm guessing that people aren't putting those kinds of loops in there um, but it, it, I'd be interested to see if others have on the other hand you have to make sure that you do it right on the inner loop so that you don't uh, yeah right miss out some dynamics there yeah <laughs> and, and and you know the thing that that concerns me about it is that it as I understand the process on the synchronous machine side is that, okay, so, you know, GE is going to come along and sell you a power system stabilizer and help you tune it and get it so that it's just right for the location in the grid. And I think that if we have to do that for every single voltage source converter, if it's going to be grid forming, then perhaps it becomes prohibitive to sort of solve those kind of classical control engineering challenges over and over and over again. Um, and so it'd be interesting to know if there's a way to just kind of think of out of the box and do this in a way where it just works without having to have a sort of custom tuned PSS for every single device. Yeah. 